Transmitter device activated. Coordinate set for Earth 2. Hey everyone, welcome to the Earth 2 podcast, the podcast where we explore the origins and development of the DC multiverse and the legacy of Golden Age characters throughout the Silver and Bronze Ages of comics. I'm Peter. And I'm David. Welcome back. And it's another big one today. It is indeed. It's part two of the very first Justice League of America, Justice Society of America team up. It is Crisis on Earth 2. Yep. Issue 22 of Justice League of America, published on July the 25th, 1963, with a cover date of September 1963. Now, the cover to this issue is sensational. We've got yep. both the Green Lanterns yep. uh, out in a blue background, spacey, dimensionary place. And we have several members of the Justice League and Justice Society in cages together. Yep. Uh, and the Green Lanterns are using their beams trying to free them. Yep, and Alan Scott is thinking to himself, only by using the combined might of our power rings can we hope to free our fellow members trapped in these space prisons. And there's four sort of cages visible on the, on the cover, um, all linked together by chains. And the first one has Wonder Woman and Black Canary. Mm-hmm. The second one has both the Flashes. The third one has the Martian Manhunter and Hawkman. And the fourth one has Green Arrow and who's that? Well, it's coloured to look like the Atom, the Golden Age Atom. Yes. But it's evidently Doctor Fate. Uh-huh. Uh, and I'm sure in reprints it's been... I'll have a quick look at my to-hand copy of Crisis and Multiple Earths Volume 1. Yes, and it's been fixed. Well, it's been kind of fixed. Um, he still has a yellow leg, but it's been obviously recoloured to it, so that it's obviously Doctor Fate. It's interesting because there's an awful lot of atom miscolouring going, going on. Yes, that seems you know, to be in this, in this whole sort of thing at the moment. And also, the, um, the colouring of Doctor Fate in this is the same colouring they would use for a character called Doctor Chaos. That's right. That we will eventually yes, sue, uh-huh. uh, when we hit the, issue of, when we hit the 1980s. Yes, yeah, an issue of Superboy. Uh-huh. He, he rocks up in, and it's very fascinating character whose very existence just to this day just makes me go wow <laughs> why didn't why has he never been back but anyway that that's we'll there save we all that chat for when we get to the new adventures of superboy that's the cover it's a beauty and it was homaged i want to say recently but of course it was nearly 20 years ago and it was homaged by an issue of um of tom strong yes we'll, we'll, of course which uh-huh. is a beauty and we'll put the cover of that up on the socials you can see them side by side fantastic so the roll call is the same as it was the previous issue I must point out, though, um, in the original issue 22 here, the sort of lovely roll call shots with all the little headshots and captions for each character, but the Atom, the Ray Palmer version of the Atom, the Earth 1 Atom, if you like, his mask is called in red. Which is wrong! It should I be know. blue! It should be blue, and it's... um. They just don't know how to colour these Atoms. You know, it's, it's interesting. I mentioned this when we were talking about, I think it must have been issue 15. It was issue 15, yeah. Um, recently, in, how, in the, the little reprint section, the Atom's mask was coloured in red. And it's you know, it's funny because, on, obviously, in the cover, as we've just said, Dr. Fate is coloured as the Atom, and here we've, you know, the Atom coloured as someone else entirely. Don't be the Atom if you want to be <laughs> coloured properly if you're in Crisis on Earth 2. Yes. Yeah. Mm. And an interesting way they've portrayed this story is rather than give us a normal splash page, they've given us a recap page, which is a thing that uh, is quite common in modern comics. Marvel do it all the time. They've got a one-page recap instead of a splash page. Mm -hmm. So let's just fill you in on the story so far. Mm -hmm. As recounted in Crisis on Earth 1 in the previous issue, there is a second Earth, almost a duplicate to our own which coexists with our world in different vibratory dimensions. And just as a group of superheroes has banded together to form the Justice League of America on our Earth, so has a similar team been formed on Earth 2, the Justice Society of America. Meeting in the borderland between the two Earths, the crime champions, a sex set of villains from both Earths, plot to commit a series of robberies, and then hide out in perfect safety on each other's Earths, where they are unknown. However, as a precautionary measure, the Flashes of Earth 1 and Earth 2, the only ones who might identify the villains in their separate Earth havens, are quickly imprisoned inside inescapable energy bubbles in the borderland between the two Earths. The criminal coup is successfully pulled off despite the attempts of the Justice League of America and Justice Society of America to stop it. In a follow-up battle, the Justice League members become trapped in their Earth-1 headquarters, from which they are unable to escape because it is ringed with awesome magical powers. As a last desperate hope, they resort to a seance, which materialises the Justice Society members inside the JLA headquarters. With the magical help of Dr. Fate, the Justice League of America is shifted to Earth-2 to resume its battle with its regular foes, while the Justice Society of America remains on Earth-1 to pursue the arch-villains from its world. Now you're ready to proceed with this follow-up story, Crisis Crisis on on Earth Earth 2. Moving straight into the story. 
First panel has Alan and Hal, two Green Lanterns, streaking off and it says, sent out to rescue the trap flashes and the energy bubbles between the Earth 1 and Earth 2 are the two Green Lanterns. And then we cut to the Justice Society and the caption tells us, meanwhile on Earth 1, the members of the Justice Society of America are racing to seek out and overcome their arch foes. So we see the five other members of the JSA. We see Hawkman, Doctor Fate, Our Man, Black Canary and the Atom. And Hawkman is proclaiming, Radio reports say the wizard is robbing in Alfalfa City. Alfalfa City, gee whiz. And our man is saying, and that the fiddler is carrying on a one-man crime wave around Clayville. And then Dr. Fate declares, The icicles pulled a job outside three corners. Outside three corners. So, Mm. soon after, in the Clayville Natural History Museum, there's a statue of some elephants and... Some other exhibits in the background. And our man and the atom come running in. And the atom cries... There he is, the fiddler. And Rex, the hour man, says, let's make sure we wrap him up good this time, Atom. Him and his fiddle. Of course, because you can't do one without the other. That's it. So, caption says, his violin leaps to a shoulder as the fiddler, who has resumed his normal identity after posing as Felix Faust, of course. He's put his wig back on. Yeah, all that nonsense that we had in the last one there, which was very confusing when I I was making notes and working out a script. Listeners, I don't mind saying... So yes, the the fiddler sends a flow of musical energy into the air and the fiddler thinks to himself, my old foes, my plan to steal a special museum fund appears to have met with a temporary delay. And in response to the melodious summons, basically we see as models of, the, of a polar bear and a gorilla burst out with the sort of barriers of the windows, I suppose, they're behind. Being animated by yeah. musical notes. And um, an hour man shouts, a polar bear come to life. And a gorilla, says the atom. Yep. All right, this is good. Long, unused super muscles flex as these old timers do battle once again. So we see Rex punching a polar bear <laughs> in the and face. He, yep, That's and he says, Man, this is really living. And Atom says, I haven't felt this alive in years, as he socks the big monkey in the stomach. Yep, and we see that the feather in the background filling away, and we see a pterodactyl model come to life. To join the bear and the gorilla, the fiddler, yep, activates the pterodactyl and the kangaroo. We see. The pterodactyl sort of swooping down as the fiddler is do 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 away. Rex is in the background of this panel fighting the polar bear. Al's still fighting the um sorry the atom. I should start using the superhero name, shouldn't I? Really, the atom is fighting the gorilla, and we see the kangaroo looping, leaping in on our man. Oh no! And now the Justice Society duo is battling with grim ferocity, as the caption. And Rex is thinking to himself, their powerful grip preventing me from reaching my radio belt. What? And he says, Atom. Can you manage to hurl that winged reptile in my direction? Well, exerting his last ounce of strength, the atom sends the pterodactyl flying straight towards our man. And he says, coming up, one pterodactyl on the wing. And he tosses the pterodactyl away. Yep. As the stuffed creature crashes into the man of the hour, the impact turns on his radio belt. The Rex has managed, obviously, as he fights with the, the kangaroo and the polar bear, to twist himself so that the pterodactyl's beak hits his belt. Now, if that had been an inch, or two, yeah. an inch or two below... Yes, so Rex thinks to himself, our man <clears throat> thinks to himself, I couldn't reach his controls myself, but I preset them to a frequency that will jam the fiddler's violin music. Yeah. Yeah, our man's radio bell. I don't remember that ever being used ever again, ever. Or before. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is that just maybe just something that he just, in the same way that nowadays we might tap our sort of little earpiece and communicate? Do you think that's something that he has to communicate with the other members? Or do you think maybe it's just piloting it as some something sort of, that's just yeah. been created for the, <laughs> for the purposes of this episode? Well, we'll see if anyone else has one later on. Yeah. So, as we move now on to, to page four of JLA 22, as our man's radio beeps interfere with the sound waves given off by the fiddler's violin, the animals come to an abrupt halt. The fiddler runs off, saying to himself, Phew, you two are just as dangerous as you were more than a decade ago. And we see our man in the atom, you know, in the old Batman cartoon, you saw giant captions saying crash, bang, and all that. Yes. We have like six, half a dozen giant beeps, and as the, as the gorilla and the kangaroo and the, the polar bear and the pterodactyl all sort of freeze. And freeze yes. Our man in the atom react, and it says, like twin tornadoes, the Justice Society duo cuts down the violin villain. And we've got an amazing panel. Yes, of the two of them diving rugby tackle style. Yeah, at fiddler. So the, uh, the atom has gone low, and he's grabbing the feather around the knees, and Rex, is, sorry, our man is grabbing around the neck, and he's saying, "Next stop for you is jail." And see, see if you look really closely, you can mm. see the shock in the fiddler's eyes. It's yes, actually, it's, it's, it's a actually, really, really great. Panel. I mean, I, I've I've been a bit critical as Pete and I have been discussing this. I've been a bit critical about some of Mike Sikowski's artwork I mean some of the stuff towards the end of part one is really quite blocky and really mm. quite but this is nice this is yeah that's it's, it's a bit colourful cla- yeah. yeah I mean it looks yeah. like he's had a bit more time to work on it admittedly there's no background in the panel which probably yeah. makes it a bit easier but it, 
show that and, you know, off, and we yeah. don't see Atom's face, but you know no. what we do. I mean, it's literally we see the the feather from the nose up, and he does look you know very surprised. So and again, Rex has got a big beam in his face. Yep. He's really enjoying oh, every yeah. minute of it because he's miracled out of his nut, isn't of he? Of course. The Fiddler's now dealt with, and the next caption tells us... Miles to the west in an open-air art gallery, the icicle is making off with priceless works of art. Yeah, and we see the icicle, and he's obviously he's frozen a few of the punters. There's a guy with you know with a nice hat on, and he's got his camera in his hand, and he's been frozen into a block of ice, and there's a couple, a man and a woman, they've been sort of frozen into ice. And the icicle has, is carrying a couple of statues under his arm, and the statue looks very much like a group holding a baby group, you know, from the back, sort of big. Wow. Anyway. And we see at the very top left of the panel, we can see Dr. Fate sort of flying in, and the icicle thinks to himself, these statues will bring me plenty. He went, what? It's Dr. Fate. I wasn't expecting him here on this earth, but I'm always prepared for any emergency. And of course, that's right. The, the team's swapped us to go and do all their fighting. Absolutely. And he so, fires the cold ray gun yep. uh, at Dr. Fate, and it sends a frigid blast upwards at a dark cloud, bringing a chilled rain down towards the Master of Magic. Then the rain alters its shape as... Dr. Fate's thinking... Guess I'm a little rusty after such a long time retirement. If I were in top condition, he'd never have had the chance to freeze me in this ice column. That's fascinating. Without going into too much detail about how Dr. Fate you know, operates and who he is and ah. all that sort of stuff, yeah. that suggests that Naboo himself has got a little bit... Rusty. Yeah. yeah. It's, rusty um, Naboo. We could end up diverging a lot of tangents and stuff here as we, we apply all the knowledge that we've grown up with over the last umpteen many years about the Just Society until, until these stories were published 50 odd years ago. Yes. It's very interesting sort of comparing the way they're written mm-hmm. and the way they're drawn with everything that we know about them Yes. That's happened since. And how the characters are portrayed, pretty yeah. much, yes. It's very interesting. Mm-hmm. So moving on to page five, and the caption at the top says, As more and more rain falls, it freezes onto the upright ice shaft that looms gigantic as it builds second by second. And we see Dr. Fate getting trapped, trapped. In, in, in ice. And the, the icicle is thinking to himself, I'll, I want to do my, my wind my wind You always want to do that. I know. I'll build a glacier around Dr. Fate, encasing him in so much ice, I'll have plenty of time to make my getaway. Surrounded by numbing ice, the man of magic calls upon his great powers so long unused. Interesting. Mm, okay. That's a good Doctor Fate. Look at that panel. Mm-hmm. Very good. That's story. that's a really nice picture of him. We see um, magic beam coming out of his hands, yeah. and he's thinking, "All the wisdom of ancient Egypt is in my mind. I must release it by the spells of the lost book of Toth." These. This is you know a reintroduction to characters that haven't been around for quite a long time. Yeah. You know, Doctor Fate vanished from All Star Comics when about should twenty odd. You know, he you know, had his own solo strip for a while after that. But mm-hmm. so there will be a lot of people reading this comic at the time who won't know who Doctor Fate is. Yeah, his background, the character, you know, and you know Egyptology and all that. So it's, it's interesting. Mm-hmm. But I think we should probably, we should probably take that into account a bit as we go. So the next, anyway, the next panel, the the caption tells us in response to the modern mages' mental orders, streaks of magical lightning tunnel a narrow path through the ice, and we see some sort of <laughs> effects as, Sizzling. as as Kent is sort of you know working his way out, streaking upward. The magical bolts form mighty fires in the sky that hurtle down upon the frozen. Co- so he's melting the ice basically. So hot and fierce are the falling flames that the ice quickly melts to water, and we see Doctor Fate emerging from from the ice. The giant sort of <laughs> steam coming right yeah. off of there. Yes. Turning the page, quickly Dr. Fate directs the water to change into a flash flood that sweeps the icicle off his feet. Oh, I dare not activate my cold ray gun or I'll freeze myself in solid ice. And Dr. Fate's flying above him saying, When you hit the wall and are knocked out, you'll wake up in the nearest jail. That's optimistic of Kent really there, isn't it? <laughs> should be not more... if you break your neck, you know. Should, <laughs> oh. should be a bit more thorough. Right, the next the next bit is basically is Black Canary and Hawkman versus the Wizards, so... Elsewhere, the shadow of Hawkman keeps pace with the racing Black Canary as they rush to keep a rendezvous with the Wizards. So Black Canary's run here on foot, apparently. Yep. And uh, Hawkman's been flying over. Interesting. And Carter says... I see the wizard up ahead, making his getaway after robbing a jewellery store. Black Canary says, You can have first crack at him, Hawkman. I'll deal him the finishing touch. It's interesting, was the two bird characters? Yeah, good point. Yeah. Yeah. I'm done that. We see the wizard sort of mincing off with a, looks like a doctor's bag, and he's firing some (laughs) bolts back at at Hawkman from his magic wand, and he's thinking to himself, The flying fury really will be mad when my magical wand commands his wings to fly him into outer space. Oh no. As for the Black Canary, I'll rock her back on her heels. And we see him blasting his, his wand towards a pile of rocks. They're just sort of running past. So. Was, it, was it being played by Sylvester McCoy then? Yeah. I rock the talks. 
So, after robbing a jewellery store, so obviously this jewellery store must be on the, the city limits of the desert. Yes, yeah, that's <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. It must be, I'm guessing that these rocks are maybe the bit, the famous rocks that are used in Arena, the Star Trek episode, yes. and also... L- last chance to get your gemstones. In, in Bill and Ted's bogus journey when death <laughs> flings them off the... I think it's through, in, in a recent BTS video as well. So, Hawkman has been zapped, and the caption tells us, upward into the upper layers of the atmosphere rises the wind wonder as mighty pinions defying his control. And it's, it's quite a nice shot, actually, of Carter very high up and you can see like the ground underneath them where it's obviously it's been divided up into sort of like you know fields fields and sort of desert te- areas. and marked out and it's, it's quite interesting it's, mm. I'm giving Sikowski a bit more credit again admittedly the Hawkman figure himself is a wee bit blocky but it really gives you the sense that he's that high up yeah true far below the Black Canary struggles with magic endowed beings of solid rock who leap to intercept her it looks like two big sort of statue guys, very actually, you know, it's kind of reminiscent of the guys from JLA number 15, but obviously they're kind of regular size, sort of dino size, and Black Canary sort of saying, oh, I can't shake this man walk off. Make your own jokes. Yep. Uh, gripped by hands that tighten around her body, the girl gladiator struggles furiously. No matter what I do, these things still cling to me. They weigh so much, they're forcing me off my feet. As she goes down, Black Canary can torch herself, so that's her nimble fingers yank open her canary amulets. Dinah thinks to herself, my one hope is to prevent the wizard from directing the actions of his rocky puppets. And sure enough, yes, she is now down on the desert floor. Uh, and her hands up, that's her neck. Yep, and the next caption says, from the amulet, she lifts a burning glass and focuses it upon some nearby bushes. I'm not an expert on Black Canary, but that's a new one on me. It is. Um, Lots of stuff getting added to these James yeah. Ayers, this issue. It makes me kind of want to go and write a, a story set in the 60s that uses all this stuff. Our man's radio belt, etc., So, right, continue with the story. Bottom of page seven now, if you're reading along. So intense is the heat from her special gadget that the bushes burst into flame. Upward rose a thick wall of black smoke, and we see the wizard directing his wand at the flames and the smoke and thinking to himself, unless I see my rock men, I can't direct their battle against the Black Canary. Then leaping upward through the wall of smoke and flame comes Black Canary. So we see Black Canary sort of leaping up through the smoke and flame and the wizard is saying, my wand turning into a medieval battle mace will knock you cold. And he's flinging it at her. Of course, you missed, wizard. But I won't. Dinah jumps out of the way. Gripped in powerful hands, the great magician is swung up and flung high in a jiu-jitsu wrestling hold. My compliments on your neat trick, Black Canary. Now it's my turn to top you. And this panel's really nice because it's quite it's all done in silhouette. Yep. John C. Demma, Pure Avengers style, mm-hmm. which I love. Even as the wizard sails through the air, his enchantment oh. begins to take effect as... Yep, and Black Canary's crying, Oh, my body turning to solid marble. And right enough, we see him. It is. A hand gesture, magical hand gesture from yep. the wizard. It's coming into panel there. Yep. So, meanwhile, carrying his disobedient wings in a hand and supported by eagles whose language he speaks and who obey his commands, comes Hawkman. And he's coming in saying, Luckily the wizard hurled his battle mace upward. Such an angle, I can grab hold of it. See, this is good. I mean, I can imagine that working really well if it was, you know, in a movie or something. Mm-hmm. You know? So we see right enough the eagles are holding Carter by his belt, and he's got his wings in his right hand. He catches the mace in his left hand, and then caption at the top of page nine under his command, his eagle friends swoop low above the ground, so that the yeah. moment he becomes unconscious, his magic will stop. Yep, Hawkman As... basically wallops the the wizard with the mace, and there's a nice satisfying thud sound effect. Yeah, it looks like it's hit him right in the face. Which yeah. If it was a mace, he would have serious, serious, serious yeah. damage to him. Yeah. But the angle of trajectory there does a little bit. And then it's obviously the, the wizard's become unconscious, so Black Canary reverts to normal. Hawkman asks, Are you alright, Black Canary? Thanks to you, I am. But how did you escape the wizard's magic? I summoned my friends, the eagles, to catch me. And after they stopped playing Hotel California, <laughs> yeah, I Don, slipped out Don, of my Don, wings. Don Henley and Joe Walsh popped up. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> then they brought me down here, uh, just in the nick of time. Now, let's take the wizard off to jail. Meanwhile, in the misty borderland between the Earths, the two Green Lanterns are buffeted by terrible gales, and Hal Jordan exclaims, Even our superpowers are hard put to offset these incredible blasts which are slowing us down. And Alan Scott replies, Up ahead, I think I see a structure of some sort. Caption at the bottom says, story continues on the second page following. So, we get a sort of half-page public health announcement about the difference between tooth decay and rotting potatoes. And an advert to buy America's most exciting war game, which is called Task Force, and it will cost you a dollar. Before we move on to Crisis on Earth 2, Chapter 2. Sent into Earth 2 by the magical powers of Doctor Fate. 
the members of the Justice League of America set out on the trail of their arch foes Felix Faust, Doctor Alchemy and Kronos. Given another opportunity to match wits and muscles against these same champions, they are grimly determined to emerge the victors. And there's, there's a series of three panels, one that shows Martian Manhunter, mm-hmm. the Atom and Green Arrow sort of flying down an amusement park and then we see Wonder Woman and Batman in their respective aeroplanes. And then there's a brilliant panel of Superman pulling Aquaman along, and it looks like Aquaman's sort of water skiing. On his feet. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. It's fantastic. That's so Silver Age Jelly, it's unbelievable. Yep, and the, so the, um, the Wonder Woman Batman one is one of my favourite things, is when Batman's flying about in his Batplane <laughs> with, you know, with the Justice League, and yeah. of course with Diana being there. And, and invisible jet Wonder Woman's well. invisible Perfect. jet, and we basically we they're very the, close together. By yeah. the way, <laughs> the invisible jet is obviously just... flying above mm-hmm. the bat plane because we can see the bat plane through the jet, which is mm-hmm. which is nice. nice and touch. again, mm-hmm. sort of suggests that the artwork has a, a bit more care taken on it. So the first part that we see is Martian Manhunter, Green Arrow, and the Atom going after Felix Faust. He basically sort of catches them all, sends them spinning. All of his arrows go flying. John sort of manages to blow them at Felix, who magics a big target out of nowhere to catch them, and then Green Arrow fires a small arrow. To the Atom. Now, Ray, the Atom, then uses the arrow, grabs a sort of piggyback on it so he can then reach the target, and he then jumps off the target using all the arrows as sort of almost like a ladder, and he can punch out Felix, which is tremendous. And then meanwhile, Batman and Wonder Woman go after Dr. Alchemy, flying high above a mountainous countryside in their planes, which Dr. Fate's magic has fashioned for them. Wonder Woman and Batman scan the landscape for a glimpse of Dr. Alchemy. Well, could we just stop for a second? So, originally when Dr. Fate first appeared, his power set was kind of molecular manipulation. Uh, That was one of his powers. So it's interesting to see that's happened here. But he had recreations of Wonder Woman's invisible jet and Batman's bat plane. Why didn't they make the bat plane invisible as well? Um, that would be it's interesting. Handy. I mean, so like Don't the um, they've all swapped off at this point, haven't mm-hmm. they? Yeah. So he's created replicas of the aeroplanes on Earth too, mm-hmm. rather than actually just magic through the rather yeah. than him taking aeroplanes with them. Mm-hmm. So what happens to the aeroplanes afterwards? They return to their component molecules or something or nothing. They turn, maybe we'll, we'll see. And so Batman yes. saying, "Yes, the radio report said he was headed this way." But it is Dr. Alchemy who first catches sight of the high-flying superheroes and we see Dr. Alchemy and he's hiding behind a rock and he thinks to himself, Incredible! How could they possibly have escaped the secret sanctuary trap? What's the difference with my matter transformer? I'll turn their planes into winged bucking broncos! Yes, as the radiation from the matter transformer... Radi... matter transformer? Is that... Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, he's not got this phosphor stone. Right, Unless okay. it's, it's a slightly different thing. Right. And again, as we established, this is not part of what Dr. Alchemy can normally do. Mm. So it is different stuff mm-hmm. he's using in this in this story. As the radiation from the matter transformer touches their planes, the Amazon Princess and Gotham Goliath find themselves battling for their lives. Now basically, we don't actually see the transformation. We cut from a panel where we see the two airplanes in silhouette to Wonder Woman aside a winged white Pegasus and Batman on a big black Pegasus. And Wonder Woman is, is saying it loud, there are no wind currents here in this valley. If I'm tossed off, I'll fall to the ground like a stone. You and me both, Wonder Woman, so hang on! So, in the bottom of the panel, we see the radiation waves sort of emanating up from behind the rock. Mm-hmm. The doctor, that's, kind of, that's nice. So, we flip over to page 14. Dr. Alchemy is thinking to himself, Although the effects of my matter transformer last for only about 20 minutes, that will be long enough to seal the doom of Wonder Woman and Batman when they are thrown to earth by those bucking broncos. And wilder grow the winged horses, even more ferocious in their attempts to dislodge their riders. Batman says, I'm slipping off! As, I, as he's slipping off. Yeah, and, and Wonder Woman, I can't hold on any longer. <laughs> My Gal Gadot impression is good, isn't it? I wish, so, please, you, please, I please wish you could see the expression that Peter has just thrown me there. If you want to hear <laughs> more of these impressions, please write in. <laughs> if you don't want to hear any more of these please, please write in. Please. Yes. So, <laughs> suddenly Wonder Woman yanks free her magic lasso and she thinks to herself, that unusual rock formation below looks like a hitching post and gives me an idea. I'll latch onto it with one end of my lariat. And she does indeed. She does indeed, yep. And she says to herself, I can ride these wind currents easily. Catch me with your utility rope, Batman, and I'll glide you softly to the ground. We see, because Batman has been, yeah, he's sort of been dislodged and the two horses are still sort of floating there, but Wonder Woman has lassoed the, the two of them together. Um, and the caption says, but as their feet are about to touch the ground, Wonder Woman exclaims, oh, we're still falling. The ground beneath us has changed into air. More of Dr. Alchemy's handiwork. And it's interesting because the way that's drawn, Wonder Woman's hair is kind of lost amongst Batman's cape. It's a wee bit untidy. Mm-hmm. They, they could have maybe flipped them around the other way. I don't know. Anyway, so as we move on to page 15, when they hit the bottom of the crater and the air around them starts to turn to soil again, 
Batman's saying, we'll be buried alive. And Wonder Woman is now basically spinning like a top. Not if we get out of here by tunnelling a path sideways through the ground. Follow me, Batman. And she's is going that... head first yeah. through the earth. <laughs> is that yeah. something that, you know, I, don't, I haven't read enough Wonder Woman to be able to say if that's something that she does very often. Uh, I wouldn't think you'd do that very often. Yeah. So, on the surface, we see Dr. Alchemy sort of crouching with his ill-gotten gains. And he's thinking to himself, I'll hide this money I stole from the Ferndale Bank in this cave. Then he looks behind him and sees Wonder Woman sort of spinning out from behind him yep. from a hole. And he thinks, what's that? And he reaches into a pouch to take out a weapon and says, Can't anything stop you, Justice League characters? I'll turn you into solid lead. Maybe that'll hold you for a while. And then as Batman emerges from behind Wonder Woman, from out of the hole, he's, he says, You've given me an idea, Dr. Alchemy. Half in and half out of his escape tunnel, Batman makes the most desperate throw of his life as he bullets a tiny glass pellet straight for the matter transformer. Where did he get the tiny glass pellet? Anyway... Batman thinks Utility to, belt. I suppose. Yeah. But he, at least yeah, he's I mean, got something. You know, it you does know. actually look in the previous panel like that's what he's doing. Like he's digging and trying to get something out of his pocket. Sure, or whatever. yeah. Mm-hmm. So Batman thinks to himself, if I miss, he'll get Wonder Woman before she can reach him. It's very interesting. Wonder Woman doesn't have too much dialogue here, which is you're denying you the, the joy of my, my Gal Gadot impression. Oh dear, how um, So the glass pellet thuds into the matter transformer, becoming a flame. Startled, Dr. Alchemy releases his hold. Ow! Oh, that fire stung me! Yep, and we see as Wonder Woman approaches, closes in on the, the Master Transformer, which is... Is that just the Philosopher's Stone by another name? He's not got the Philosopher's Stone at this point, so right, he's got okay. this thing that's a substitute. Right. Uh, the Philosopher's Stone is recovered in time for the next issue of The Flash that appears. Right, in. okay. But yes, at the moment, he's not got the Philosopher's Stone. Uh, and... Okay, Batman flinging the glass pellet has had the desired effect. And Batman says... There was powdered lead in that pellet... And when powdered lead comes into contact with air, it bursts into flame. So there you go, kids. There you go. So we now turn the page and we move on to page 16. While Wonder Woman and Batman are leading Dr. Alchemy to jail, the two Green Lanterns burst into the Between Worlds hideout of the crime champions and we see Alan and Hal bursting through a wall. We're kind of over the shoulder of Barry and Jay who are still in the sort of bubbles that they were sort of putting. And Hal is saying, at last, we've reached the imprisoned flashes. And Barry says... A couple of Green Lanterns coming to our rescue. Waving their power rings at the bubbles, the Emerald Gladiators are amazed to discover that. And Alan's thinking, we can't get into the bubbles. Or, or bring them out, says Hal, as they both fire their Green Lantern beams at them. Yes. And then again, they hurl their titanic powers at the magical bubbles, but to no avail. Yeah. Al's kind of uh, power ringed up a, a buzzsaw. Yeah, I'm not really too sure what Alan has tried there. Oh, it's an axe. It's an axe head. It's an axe head, right, okay. Yeah. Hal's trying, and you get a big sort of sound effect. Hal's trying to cut open the bubble, and Alan's trying to smash into the, the other one, and Alan's declaring there must be a way to free them. So that's that's your sort of, you know, cut away to Green Lantern, mm-hmm. the Green Lantern and the Flash team. So even as the two Green Lanterns labour to free the two Flashes, near a lighthouse on Earth 2, and, yep, this is back to Superman and Aquaman. And, and the water sort of, skiing affair. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we see it's, a, it's a quite a nice panel. It's a nice blue-green sea with a... A lighthouse in the background, and Kronos carrying a big carriage clock in the front, and Kronos is thinking to himself, I've succeeded in stealing the rare clock that made this lighthouse famous. Oh, look, okay. who's coming to pass the time of day with me? A light, a clock that made a lighthouse famous. You know the story of the clock that made the lighthouse famous. Well, you know, to our listeners. It's passed on from generation to generation. Yeah, I mean, in, um, on Earth too. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So, to the surprise of both Superman and the Sea King, Kronos surrenders meekly. My time's run out, he says. I'm your prisoner. And Superman says, watch out for a trick, Aquaman. Yeah. Superman has landed on, on Kronos's flying sundial, yeah, yeah. and we can see the clock on the floor, and Arthur's sort of climbing up the side. Mm-hmm. Right, with Superman at the controls of the flying sundial, they move off with their captive when Superman declares, Aquaman, he's collapsed. What happened to him? And then Kronos says... And right enough, we see Arthur sort of stretched out on the, the bottom of the sundial, and Kronos says, ha-ha, my special vibration watch put him in a coma, Superman. I had it timed just right, he continues, unless you expose him to the healing rays of a certain kryptonite meteor, which I've placed on a little island in the Pacific, he is doomed, and you have only one minute in which to do it, so it's time you got started. Gee whiz, Mm -hmm. that's really raising the stakes out of nowhere, isn't it? Arthur's in a coma, kryptonite's going to fix him, Mm -hmm. and Superman doesn't like kryptonite. No. So, gripping the flying sundial with both hands, the Man of Steel, that's me, rockets across the Pacific Ocean at close to the speed of light. <laughs> yeah, How Silver Age can you get? And they don't fly off. Yeah. Sometimes. Superman is thinking to himself, Kryptonite will weaken me and perhaps destroy me, but I must risk that in order to save Aquaman. See, what a good guy. So, 
they reach the island. We see the flying sundial sort of floating above the waves, and Superman thinks to himself, Of course Kronos may be bluffing, but I don't dare call him. Aquaman's life is most important thing to be considered right now. We're now at the bottom of page 17 and the caption says, In that interval when Superman is weakened by the kryptonite and before Aquaman is fully recovered and we see Kronos and he thinks to himself, There's no time to waste. Here's where I wake my getaway while neither of them is able to stop me. He's buzzing away in his yep. flying sundial. We move to the top of page 18 and Aquaman is recovered. <clears throat> Moments later when Aquaman's strength returns to him. You saved my life, Superman, but Kronos got away. And Superman says, I figured as much... But I'll track him down with my telescopic vision. But when Superman searches for the time thief... He isn't anywhere I can see. Neither on Earth nor in the sky. This is mental. And then Arthur says, Aquaman says, That means Kronos is using his sundial vehicle to flee under the sea. I'll command the sea creatures to hunt him down for me. And in response to the sea king's telepathic command, a message is laid back from finny fish to guild being and we see some fish and an octopus and a couple of eels and that could be the earth to topo so tell us who topo is pete topo well topo is the sidekick of the silver age aquaman right before aqualad came along right okay right yeah now it's interesting at this point and for for a very 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 long time aquaman is treated as a uniquely earth one character mm-hmm I seem to remember it's going to be, you know, there's a very late issue of All-Star Squadron that men, that first mentions him, and then he, he does eventually pop up for a couple of panels before the, the Crisis and Infinite Earths kind of removes him from continuity. That's something that we'll kind of we'll bear in mind, because I remember there's, there's quite a few team-up issues where they, they, they emphasise the fact that, for example, Doctor Fate's Earth 2 and Aquaman's Earth 1. So, basically, the, the assembled watery residents are sending a message back to Arthur, and it says, Kronos moving towards the Straits of Magellan, and instantly in receipt of that news, Superman and Aquaman speed to the tip of South America. And we see no water skiing this time. Superman is flying along with Aquaman. Aquaman's got his hand around Clark's shoulder. And Superman's saying, Just before we reach the Straits, I'll drop you off. I don't want that vibratory watch of his to hurt you a second time. Second time? Ah, wordplay there. Ah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. The next panel then basically has... It's obvious that Kronos has been hiding underwater because there's a dome over the top of the, the sundial. The sundial and he's How can you tell the, the time? Yeah. <laughs> and then, so the caption says, Soon as the Man of Steel recaptures his prisoner, I'll crush the vibratory watch so you can't harm Aquaman again. Then we'll both take you to jail. You'll serve time for your crimes now. Inverted commas around time to give that emphasis. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's a, that's a bit lame, actually. <laughs> it, it feels like a, a few panels are missing. Mm. You know, because we, we see Kronos like sort of standing. The end. Yeah, sort of yeah. looking down. So anyway, we cut back to the borderland between the two Earths and it's a nice close-up of the two Green Lanterns and Hal Jordan says, there's only one hope left. Since both flashes can see and hear us. I catch a drift, GL. Light and sound waves can pass through the bubbles. All we have to do is... And at the top of page 19, we notice here there's another slight discrepancy between me reading from the original published issue 22 and Peter reading from the reprint in the in the Crisis collection. The caption in the original 22 says, Deduced to protons of light by the power rings, the two flashes burst out of their bubble prisms. Which is obviously incorrect, and it has been fixed in the reprint, because it says reduced yep. to protons of light instead. And we, yep, and we have a panel that basically shows the two the two ring blasts. And it's nice, actually, because you know they've been broken down at their constituent parts, or, but it's clear that as Jay, because of the, you can see the shape of his helmet, yep. and it, there's a hint of the, the ear flashes on Barry's. So, so basically we see sort of loose sort of shapes of Barry and Jay as they sort of move through the... And you, you can also tell you can also tell which Green Lantern is bringing which uh, flash out because yep. of the the hands that they wear the rings on. Yep. Because you just have the two Green Lantern hands just just in the panel, but you can tell who's who because Alan has his ring on his left hand, Alan says on his right. Yep. Apart from that short sort of way that the Kronos thing was wound up, I'm, mm-hmm. again I'm really impressed by the artwork again in this this issue. Um, I think the second part's a lot stronger than the first part. Yeah, so definitely. Yeah. So the next panel, um, but as soon as they regain their freedom, both the flashes and Green Lanterns. Shimmer and fade out of existence. Ooh. At the, the same, same moment yeah. on Earth One. Yep, the the Justice Society. So we can see Doctor Fate with the Icicle and Hawkman with the Wizard and Black Canary, and Our Man and the Atom. And they basically, it's obviously they're kind of been in the process of shepherding the baddies that they've caught. But the JSA are doing a fade out, and the Wizard says, "Ha ha! There go our captors fading out. Our foresight in arranging a trap to snap shut around them if they ever freed the flashes is sure paying off." That's brilliant. As you read across, Doctor Fate is pretty much translucent, mm-hmm. and Hawkman and Black Canary are almost as translucent. And then Our Man doesn't look that translucent, and the Atom doesn't look that bad. It's almost like the effect is sort of catching each yeah, of them different times. Yeah. yeah. And then we have Caption saying, "And they're off too." And we, again, we see the Justice League members who've who've got everyone all to, grouped together, and the the Justice League are starting to fade out too. And Felix Faust says, 
We couldn't trap them this way without the help of the two Green Lanterns, because we didn't have enough power to work the incantation. As soon as the Green Lanterns supplied that extra power by freeing the flashes, the trap sprang shut. Story continues on third page following. There's another advert for Tootsie Rolls, and we flip the page, and there's an advert for some war toys, and there is a letters page. And then we move to a nice big retro DC Comics subscription advert, which is offering the reader the chance to subscribe to The Flash, Whirlwind Adventures of the Fastest Man on Earth, The Atom, the explosive stories about the world's smallest superhero, Green Lantern, the Power Ring Champion of Justice, Justice League of America, the world's greatest superheroes and star-studded spectaculars, Mystery in Space, Thrills and Excitement of Tomorrow's Space Age, Strange Adventures, Amazing Science Fiction Tales, Wonder Woman, The Fearless Amazon in Dazzling Feats on Earth, and Other Worlds. Showcase, where daring new comic heroes and themes are presented for the first time, Superman, the mightiest hero in the universe, and finally in this little list, Tomahawk. Tomahawk battles Indians and British in colonial times. Interesting. That's interesting. No mention of Batman or any of that lot. We have now reached Crisis on Earth 2, Chapter 3. And the caption tells us, As they disappear from Earth 1 and Earth 2, the Justice League and Justice Society members find themselves locked inside cages far out in the depths of space. And this is a brilliant panel Yeah, that starts this off. So what we have is... um. Sort of in clockwise, from the bottom left, we have the two atoms together. So Al Pratt with Ray Palmer on his shoulder. And then the next cage with um, Green Arrow and Dr. Fate, which you know is obviously where it should have been on the cover. Then Hawkman and Martian Manhunter. Then the two Flashes, Aquaman and Superman together. Um, in the top corner, we have Iron Man and Batman. And that's a conversation I'd like to have seen. Then we see Wonder Woman and Black Canary together. And then, finally, the two Green Lanterns. And they're all in these sort of like yellow boxes with glass barred windows. And they're all chained together in the floating. And the caption at the bottom of page 20 says, Neither the power rings of the two Green Lanterns nor the superpowers of the various members can manage an escape. And we see Superman and Aquaman's cage and Superman's punching the bars to the big thud. Yep. And he says, There's no kryptonite around, so these cages must have been fashioned by magic. And in the next panel, we see Ray Palmer, who's, who's obviously shrunk down, and he's thinking to himself, No matter how hard I try, I can't shrink between the atoms of this cage. And then, so the final panel is our man, and he's punching the ceiling of his cage, and he's thinking to himself, I improved my medical pills over the, over the past 20 years to give me even greater powers than I used to have, but to no avail. Now, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. The last 20 years. So he's retired. This is 63. Is that them acknowledging the fact that our man retired before everyone else? That's well, why would he be trying to improve his medical pills then? If he was not intending to come out of retirement, was he doing it for someone else? He's saying 20 years, so that, mm -hmm. that really closely ties into to the real continuity. Uh -huh. that, Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So. Moving on to page 21, the caption at the top reads, Suddenly, the Atom, and it's Ray Palmer at the meaning, the Atom contacts the Green Lanterns through the telepathic communication system between the cages. I can't slip through the atoms of my cage because it was especially designed to prevent it. But maybe you two can make yourself small and drop between the atoms of your cage. Green Lantern Hal Jordan of Earth One says, It's an idea. And Alan Scott finishes by saying, Worth trying. Yeah. Turning their power rings on themselves, the Emerald Gladiators shrink their bodies to subatomic size and plummet through the floor of the cage. Hal saying, We must coat our bodies with a power sheath to protect ourselves against the dangers of space. Then free the others, says Alan, whose job it seems to be is to finish Hal's sentence. Yeah, they're obviously, they've, they've obviously bonded mm -hmm. and clicked and established a rapport very quickly. So they hurl their full might of the power rings at the cages containing the flashes. Now this panel is the cover. cover. Yeah. Front cover. Mm -hmm. But all, all we can see is the, the cage with Barry and, and Jay. But a shot of Alan and Hal sort of lasting their, their rings at it. And Alan is saying, We don't quite have enough power to force it open. And Hal says... Wait, we've diverted some of our power to protect ourselves in these auras. If we turn that extra power onto the cage, it might do the trick. This is like in Star Trek, where we don't have enough power to do something, we have to divert power from life support. Yeah. So, instantly both Green Lanterns remove their auras and concentrate the full strength of their power rings on the Flash's cage. And, and Alan's thinking, or saying, uh, we can survive for a few moments without our auras. And Hal says, as the cage basically bursts open under the, the combined sort of one stop from the power rings, it worked. Now quickly throw green auras about ourselves and the flashes. And safe from the danger of space, the two speedsters help the exhausted green lantern open the next cell. And Barry thinks to himself, our super vibrations are breaking this one open. And they've they've, they've moved on to the, the cage with Wonder Woman and Black Canary. And Wonder Woman is saying, because ladies first. Yes, of course. Yes. We'll give you a hand with the other cages, boys. And within moments, all the cages have been broken. Yep. And we see everyone in a big Green Lantern created sort of like bullet. 
Interestingly enough, uh, yeah, they're all standing there, including the Flash, Barry Flash, who has yellow boots. So the, he should not be able to stand well, on that. It's, it's clear that both Alan and Hal, because Alan's at the back and Hal's at the front, so maybe they're Oh, combined. Alan is at the back. I do apologise. Yeah, maybe yes, they're combined. So but basically Superman and Doctor Fate are flying along outside. They're, they're, they're firing. Yes. They're, they're rocking through space and Hal says, now let's mix it with those crime champions for the last time. And on Earth 2, the crime champions have joined forces after the imprisonment of the Justice League and Justice Society members. But now... Felix Faust is saying, yes. wait, I sense danger, and he Peter, his hand up its yeah. temple. Peter was doing a great job there of miming, yes. having his hand up to his temple. <laughs> great, great radio with that. <laughs> and the wizard is, is saying, as do I. Incredible as it seems, our arch foes have managed to escape from their space cages. Icicle says... Yep, this time I've got a sinking feeling that when we battle them again, they'll nab us for good. And then Kronos says... Then we've got to escape, where they'll never find us. And then Felix Faust asks Kronos... But where? Suddenly the fiddler cries out. I've got it. There is an Earth 1 and an Earth 2. Somewhere there must be an Earth 3. Oh, oh. foreshadowing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we can find the doorway into it before the Justice Champions find us, we can escape them forever. Justice Champions must have been the... Bit of rebranding there. Must have been the... the, the, So she may then call them the Amazing (laughs) Super Friends again. That would have been nice. Um... For a few precious seconds, they conduct their search, and Felix says, If magic hides it, we'll uncover the passageway. Fiddler declares, I found the gateway to Earth 1 with my sonic vibrations. Maybe I can do the same for Earth 3. And Kronos continues, If time hides it, my chronological knowledge will reveal it. And then the icicle says, Too late, here they come, all of them. And we then have a fantastic kind of double-page spread of a big massive battle scene. The first caption reads... Like human thunderbolts, the exasperated members of the combined Justice League and Justice Society hurtle upon their arch foes. Now, good superpower clashes with wicked superpower in this critical battle for two worlds. It is knockdown down and drag out fight all the way. It's basically six big panels without panel border frames and we see Green Arrow and our man and the Ray Palmer Atom fighting the icicles. So basically... It looks like Ollie fires an arrow through a wall of ice that Icicle's created and the atom sort of flies through to hit him. And then the next panel, it's the Flash running around the wizard as Wonder Woman lassoes him and Aquaman just looks like he's applauding, basically. And then the next <laughs> I think one... he's about to catch him. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Then the next one, as Dr. Alchemy fires one of his radiation blasts at Superman and then we see Green Lantern Alan Scott punching him out with a big... Boxing glove. Power ring boxing yes. glove. So then at the top of page 24... We have another caption yep. reading, The sounds of battle rage as Justice League and Justice Society members fight side by side against their bitter foes. Their every deed and every thought is concentrated on defeating these men who have tricked and trapped them at every turn. No longer are the Justice Society members rusty. They have passed through their baptism of fire and only too eager to demonstrate their powers <laughs> that made them famous <laughs> in the good old days. So, the next vignette is the Fiddler and the Earth 2 Atom is going for him and Hawkman's floating and how Jordan Green Lantern is using his power ring to conjure like a giant saxophone. <laughs> yeah, and, and a, a clarinet. Yeah, things. which are, and the notes which are sort of coming out of these are obviously, you know, running counter to what the Fiddler is trying to achieve. In the next panel, we have the Flash, Barry Allen, coming up behind Felix Faust as Batman and Dr. Fate kind of get him from the front. It looks like Batman's thrown some kind of blackout bomb mm-hmm. as Dr. Fate is firing a little few bolts of electricity. And then finally, Kronos basically sort of throwing lots of clocks at <laughs> Black Canary and Martian Manhunter as Martian Manhunter uses his Martian breath to knock Kronos over. And it's, it's a very iconic page. We will put this on the socials. Definitely. It's wonderful. So, so and it also appears to be correctly coloured. <laughs> yes. So, so basically, before you know it, it's all over. Mm-hmm. Top of page 25, and again, page 25 is not a full page. It's, there's another Tootsie Roll advert at the bottom, and the caption at the, start, the top says, Then, when the sounds of battle die away, and we see Dr. Fate, and he proclaims, We save not only Earth 1 and Earth 2, but for all we know, Earth 3 as well. And Hawkman says, with hands on his hips, Yes, and we'll take precautions to see they never threaten anyone or anything else again. So in this whole panel, we see Kronos and the Fiddler and Icicle and Felix and everyone and the wizard with his hat off all kind of flattened out on the ground. And left to right, we see our man, Wonder Woman, Black Canary, Doctor Fate, Flash of Earth 1, the Atom of Earth 2, uh, Martian Manhunter, Aquaman, the Flash of Earth 2, Superman, Green Arrow, Hawkman of Earth 2, the two Green Lanterns and Batman and Ray Palmer, the Atom, is standing on the knee of the wizard, and they're all just stretched out, and they're just all spaced out, just just basically having a good old gloat. And our final caption reads, 
After the crime champions have been securely jailed, and Hawkman says, We're going to keep in touch. There's no telling when we might be called upon to join forces again. And Aquaman is saying, I can just see Snapper Carl's face when he learns he had to miss our biggest adventure of all because he had to take college exams. I hope he passed his tests as well as we did ours. The and alas, we'll never find out. <laughs> um, and you know, the final thing of the year is the Atom. Ray Palmer is now standing on Batman's shoulder and they're all just having a nice little blather. Yeah, so... And again, they're all beaming. Looking yes, at each other, beaming. They're absolutely happy. delighted. And, um, well, maybe Doctor Fate isn't, you can't tell. Yeah, there's some more adverts for some more war toys and stuff. And there we have it, the first Justice League... Just the Society team-up of many. They're only really together for the last chapter of it all. Pretty much, yeah. And they're all really fighting together in a, in a style that we'll get used to of, of them mixing and matching for the, for the last couple of pages. Yeah, overall, I thoroughly enjoyed it as well. Really good, great team dynamics. A bit of a clunky first part of the film, but the second yeah. part certainly went on at a good pace. And as, a, as I say, I've, I've been banging on about the, the artwork being so much better in the second the mm-hmm. second part. No, it, was, it was cool, it was... And as we talked as we were going along, all the various little extra bits that seem to have been added to the JSA's yeah. repertoire. The radio belt, the, the, the necklace, glass, the glass yeah. amulets. And there's, um, yeah. there's a, if memory serves, there's um, there's a few more similar sort of slight rebrandings. Mm-hmm. And, you know, but we'll come to them in some yep, of the other, the, the other team-ups. Right so, Pete's now going to tell us a little bit about um, the history of the JLA and JSA team-ups. Yep. And the revival of the JSA. This is from the Justice League Companion. From the lovely folks at Two Morrows Publishing. Yes. Who, who have done some brilliant stuff over the last 20 years or so of yeah, comic book archaeology. I don't know if this is uh, currently in print, but uh, if not, then I'm sure it's available digitally, so please check it out. And in one of the articles, it asks the question, whose idea was it to pair the JLA and the JSA? And we get the response, the idea hit Gardner Fox and me in the spur of the moment, revealed Julie Schwartz in The Amazing World of DC Comics issue 14 from March 1977. We showed the JSA in flashbacks in the Flash magazine. I think they even came out of retirement in one issue. Very true, Flash 137. Which we covered, yep. So it was a logical step to team up the groups. The next part of this article, which is stuff we've already sort of covered, but there's no harm talking about it again. Who originated the multiple Earths concept? Editor Julie Schwartz has reported in Secret Origins of the Super DC Heroes, Warner Books, 1976, a mass market edition reprinting classic first appearances. When pondering the reconciliation of the new and old flashes, I had a discussion with Gardner Fox. Schwartz disclosed, I said, Gardner, the easiest way to do it is to say you're in communication with another Earth, a parallel Earth in another dimension, let the flashes cross over and meet. It was a breakthrough to combine a golden age hero with a modern counterpart and have them team up. And as we discussed in the Flash 1, 2, 3 yep. episode, that differs from the Carmen Infantino cover story. But uh, yes, check out that episode I mean, I for suppose, more information there. Yeah, I mean, I suppose the way you reconcile it is probably Carmen probably drew the cover. Mm-hmm. Julie worked through with Gardner and they uh, came up on everything else yeah. and everything else spun from that. Yeah. Why wasn't Earth 2 called Earth 1 since the superheroes came first? Well, Julie Schwartz admitted to that gaffe. I gave names to the two worlds of the Flash's story title. He reminisced in his Man of Two Worlds bio. I called the world that existed for the current characters in continuity, like Barry Allen, Earth 1, and the world of the previous Golden Age characters, such as Jay Garrick, Earth 2. By the way, those of you currently reading this book inhabit a different Earth, which I had dubbed Earth Prime. Yeah, I know from a chronological standpoint I sort of got it backward, but I wasn't thinking about that until it was way too late to change things. And as we know, as we've covered already, uh, the Earth 1 and Earth 2 designations yep. didn't actually appear until now. That probably should have happened in the issue of The Flash or something, shouldn't it? Yeah. So digging a bit deeper into our, our respective archives, I've dug out issue 7 of Roy Thomas's fanzine Alter Ego. This is the revived version of it. This issue, cover dated winter 2001, which is a, a nice Rich Buckler recreation of the, the cover to GLA 21 with you know, a couple of different GSAs involved. There's just a little segment here where Roy Thomas is interviewing Julie Schwartz. Um, so this is Roy sort of talking to you and he says, Even after Justice League started, Jerry Bales and I, and I'm sure other people suggested, bringing back the JSA, the JSA itself. And yet, when you actually did it, you did it in a unique way with this parallel world business. Do you remember how that came about? Why that particular way of bringing the JSA back? Did it go out of that issue of Flash Comics we'd seen Barry Allen reading in Showcase number 4? Mm-hmm. And Julie Schwartz answers here, um, well, as you remember, when Barry Allen realised he had superpowers and was thinking what he wanted to do with them, he remembered the old Flash. And at that point, I said, there's a second Earth. And when I used the term second Earth to think about what I would call this Earth, I said Earth 2, because it was the second Earth. It should have been the other way around, of course. And then Roy says, yeah, but that's okay. Nobody cared. The main thing is it was a great idea. And Julie mm. resp- responds to Roy at this point, well, I care, of course. I had to go to Earth 3 and eventually to Earth Prime, but Earth 2 should have been Earth 1. Let's get that straight. 
A bit further on the interview, Roy asks Julie, originally did you have any thought that the Earth 2 stories might become a regular thing, as they did especially in Justice League after the initial Crisis story? Julie replies, correct me if I'm wrong, when I did the Crisis on Earth 1, Crisis on Earth 2 story, which is a two-parter, I believe that was the first time Justice League story hadn't been completed in one issue. But Roy corrects Julie here and says, except for the Felix Faust story. So Julie continues, when the second Crisis issue appeared, I took up the whole front splash page with a summary of what happened before. And Roy Thomas says, with all those heads, and Julie says, wasn't that a great idea? I wish they'd do that today. And Roy says, like a scorecard. With that many characters, you needed a scorecard. Which obviously, you know, but they don't mention the fact that Ray Palmer's head was the wrong colour. No, no. <laughs> That's been swept under the carpet all these yeah. years. So, we now have the, the reader reaction to issue 22, and this is from issue 25, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Quality, right. The so, JLA mail room, join us there. There's yep, a lovely um, big uh, picture at the top of the page. Yep. All the leaguers reading their fan mail, and they're all very happy about it. Yep. It looks like Queen Latin's reading one out, and the rest of them are having the right proper good law at it. <laughs> they're probably having a laugh at Roy Thomas, pointing out a continuity error or something. They will be. And the first letter is from Bruce Baker from San Francisco. Dear Editor, thank you for giving me in the August and September issues of the Justice League of America 50 pages of action and an adventure I shall long remember. I realise that I must heap my bouquets of gratitude not on one mere man, but on a combined group of supermen in their own right, whose terrific efforts have made Crisis North 1 and its sensational sequel, Crisis North 2, a reality. I am referring, of course, to the master of comicdom, Gardner Fox, the only one who could have conceived this Odyssean account with such authenticity and perfection. I am not about to neglect your wonderful team of cover and story artists, Mike Sikowski, Murphy Anderson and Bernard Sack, who brought Gardner Fox's idea to life. I have a hunch that in addition to the aforementioned people, the production of this two-book classic was accomplished by a behind-the-scenes crew, and to them I extend my appreciation. Your two-part thriller is, to me, the complete personification of all the abilities, the teamwork, and the unselfish devotion to duty of the Justice League of America. Oh, There you go. Uh, it's interesting that Bruce is also giving bouquets after uh, last week. Dave yeah. Cochran was giving bouquets and, and wine. Yeah, bouquets. Uh, yeah, so obviously, you know... They must love their flowers. A lot and, of gifting. You know, yeah, interesting. Um, the editorial response to Bruce Baker's letter. From what many of our readers tell us, when a new JLA makes its appearance, the first order of business is to turn to the letter department and see what their fellow readers had to say about a previously published issue. Well, much as we'd like to present a well-balanced assortment of favourable and unfavourable comments on the double crisis stories, we're unable to do so. Letter after letter praised them both. So, if the rest of the mailroom follows the same monotonous pattern, your readers are to blame, says Editor Julie Schwartz there. I mean, yeah, let's, let's be honest, people would have... Love this. There's no other way of putting it. Yeah. This would have made a lot of people very happy. So, second letter is from Leonard J. Tirado, 182 and a quarter Regent Street, Saratoga Springs, New York. Amazing. Hi, Leonard, if you're listening. Dear editor, though Crisis on Earth 2 was really a continuation of Crisis on Earth 1, it had a plot, as well as more than enough action to create a second new and different tale. There were several things I liked about the follow-up story. Point one, the superb battle team-up scene of the old Atom and Our Man tackling the fiddler and his animated animals. Artist Sikowski sure outdid himself here. Animated animals, thanks for the alliteration, Leonard. I'm grateful for that 60 years later. The idea of the two Green Lanterns being unable to cope with their two problems, the energy bubbles and the space prisons, made the story more exciting and enjoyable. Point three, the JLA and JSA team seemed just right. Superman and Aquaman, Wonder Woman and Batman, GL and GL, Our Man and Atom all seemed to work in perfect unison. Point four, Superb story idea with action, magic, superheroes versus super foes, and science fiction all woven together. Lovely. And the next letter from John Fay from Springfield, Colorado, and he says, Dear Editor, Crisis on Earth 2 really got going in the first page to the very last. This is the first comic I've ever seen laid out in this manner. Instead of the usual splash panel on page one, there was a full page script panel explaining in detail the first part that had appeared in the previous issue so that the story could begin without any wasted space. I will treasure the splash panel on page 20 as well as the remarkable two-page panels on pages 23 and 24. However, looking over this double-page spread started me thinking. A measly six slightly overrated <laughs> villains against 16 of the world's greatest superheroes. However, this did not impede uh, in the least uh, with my enjoyment of the story. Thank you, John. I mean, that's that's something else. We're so used in our old age and living the time we do, we're so used to like, superhero team-ups, you know, and all that sort of stuff. I mean, this is obviously long before 
stuff like Marvel Team Up, Marvel Two in One, DC Comics presents Long Braven, vote event books. You know, this was your event book. You know, Braven Braven Bold being a team up. You know, to, you know, properly established as a team up book. It's it's very it's probably very difficult from the, the position we're in now just to imagine just how exciting this actually was. Yes. It's a big deal. Right, so the next letter is from John DeVry, 12 Hillview Avenue, Madison, New Jersey, I'm guessing that is. Okay, dear editor, without a doubt you have succeeded in publishing the greatest story in the entire history of comics. Yeah. Wow. Never has a single full-length story featured so many courageous champions, so many excellent villains, or such an intricately devised plot. On the basis of it all, the long-awaited revival of the Justice Society of America was drifted into limbo for more than a decade and which now once again emerges in a glorious resurrection. That ties back to what we've been saying already. It's been so long since the Justice Society have been using comics in a contemporary style, because what, New 52 kicked in in 2011? Yep. And it's only in the last, you know, six months or so that we've seen them come back in Doomsday Clock. We did have the Earth 2 versions, but that, yeah. was, that was a different universe, yeah. a different it's, day. Um, it's crazy. <clears throat> so yes, John continues, the Justice League is always great, and these two issues, it surpassed itself. But let me devote the core of this letter to the Justice Society, whose members thought by many to be washed up due to age and inactivity at no time were deterred from achieving their noblest purpose, the triumph of justice over crime. Hooray. It is in their honour that I commend them for the courage, fighting spirit, perseverance, patience and guile displayed on both Earth 1 and Earth 2. What a great letter. Next up we have Robert Malasani from Toronto in Canada. He says, Dear Editor, after reading Crisis on Earth 1... I took it for granted that any sequel would not, could not, continue in the same excellent standards. But, oh, I was wrong. The two parts flowed into each other so smoothly, continuing with the same quality, that I barely noticed the time lapse between issues. What strikes me as the most amazing is the manner in which you were able to allow each of the 22 characters equal time. Though I usually find complaints with Mr Sikowski's artwork, I was so thrilled with this whole thing that I can't help hand him a few compliments too. He did some excellent shots of Wonder Woman, Black Canary, the Ace Girl, and the Wizards. There we are. So yeah, a bit some more praise for for Sikowski. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, what other what other team books were there? You know, going on. You know, there wasn't. There was nothing like this, really, was uh, there? Fantastic Four had kicked off. Challengers, the Unknown. Mm. Still a bit away from Doom Patrol and X Men. The Legion were around. Legion they? were around, but, but they weren't. They were only occasional, yeah, really, uh-huh. by this point. Again, as, as I keep saying, you know, we have to remember the perspective of when this was done. Absolutely. So the final letter is from Doug Potter. From um, Texas, yeah, 1506 Zuber Drive. Dear editor, I have but one comment to make. I can't figure out why you printed Crisis on Earth 2, much as I enjoyed it, because you will never be able to top it. There you <laughs> are. Well, we'll just see, shall we, then, Mr. Potter? We shall see. And if you're listening, why don't you get in touch with us and let us know if you think it has been topped? <laughs> you can send us an email, ask can you, dear listener, at the Earth 2 podcast at gmail.com. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at the Earth 2 Podcast. It's always the number two with our social media. And you can follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore Earth 2. So, thanks again for joining us on our journey. And we'll talk to you next time on the, the Earth, Earth 2, 2 Podcast. Transmatter Cube activated. Return coordinates set for Earth Prime.